up and go a little bit further this morning. I'm try, going to try to move very quickly because we have communion here in a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to try to move through this fairly fast today. Um, you know, Satan is using the same tricks to fool us today that he's been using for 6,000 years. And I think maturity should bring us to the place or we should become mature enough that we don't keep falling for the same thing over and over again. Amen. God didn't set you up to constantly be spiritually beat down by the enemy. He didn't set you up to lose all the time. He didn't set you up to feel like you don't fit all the time. I found a lot of times in my life when I feel like I don't fit, if I get digging deep enough, I've let too much rob come to the surface. Amen. I was talking to Bill White back there a while ago, and I made the statement was we were talking, you know, there really is no place in Christianity for the victim mindset. There really is not. The Apostle Paul made the statement, even if we're led like lambs to the slaughter and we are killed all day long, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And what he's saying is that you won't ever face death. What he's saying is when you face death, you'll still walk out with the victory when Jesus raises you from the dead. Amen. You know, the resurrection is not much we talk about anymore in church. We talk about blessings. We talk about financial blessings. We talk about... Uh, all these other things, but we very seldom talk about why we're here. And the truth is, <laughs> I seen a meme on TV the other day, that said, or not on TV, but on Facebook that said this. It said, some folks are going to go to heaven, this pristine, well-kept body. And the guy said, I just want to slide in at the last moment, completely broke, out of gas with nothing else to give. You're going to die either way. You can pump it up, you can paint it up, you can curl it, you can collar it, you can do all those things and it ain't going to change the fact that you're going to lay this bad boy down. Amen. And victory comes in the resurrection. And it must be at the forefront of our thinking as believers when we understand that, when it becomes something that really begins to, and I want you to hear what I'm about to say, when it really begins to govern our thinking, when it begins to become the thing that teaches us how to think, then all of a sudden a lot of the pettiness that you see in the body of Christ today goes away. The, the idea of being a victim goes away. When we set the example of the Savior up before us, we really cannot look at anything we face in this world and say that we have been unjustly treated. Oh no. It's time that we quit playing the victim. I'll tell you what happens when we play the victim. And I'm not saying that people have not been victimized or the bad things haven't happened to them. But there's a difference between having something happen to you and then allowing that something to rule the rest of your life. I mean, there's been people done wrong. I'm not saying there hasn't. <clears throat> but your response to the way you were done wrong makes a difference in where you go in life. And if you walk away around all the time, poor, poor, pitiful me, Number one, you're going to find yourself alone after a while because even the best people in the world don't want to hear that mess for a little bit. I have a, I have a, I have a, uh, a mindset on counseling. I counsel people. I've tried to cancel a few people, but that don't work well. Just, sorry. I'll let you come in my office. 
and pour out your problem. I found that a lot of counseling is nothing more than regurgitating information that's already been said just so we can keep the wound open. And I think that we should be able to lay out the problem and then figure out a strategic path away from it so that we leave it behind us. Amen? Seriously. To walk as a victim means you constantly are saying the same thing over and over again. Always trapped by what somebody else has done. Allowing them to have power over your life. Allowing them to direct where you go in life. And I'm not saying it's an easy battle, but it is a battle that can be won. If you have your Bible, oh, I already said that, didn't I? <laughs> Are you already at Philippians chapter 2? God knew that men was going to deal with mental reasoning, that the thoughts of a man make a big difference. As a matter of fact, true transformation comes by changing your mind, changing the way you think. Amen. Now, we have humanism that is trying to line up with some glimpse of Christianity and if we're not careful, we jump on the wrong wagon. Humanism begins to build up what you deserve right now. How you are so good that nothing should have ever been done wrong to you. Christianity doesn't do that. When you come to God and say, I'm worthy, when you're talking about it in your own, you, my friend, are walking in pride. Amen. So Christianity isn't about making a better you. It's about changing you completely. It's about changing the way you think about situations in your life. Romans chapter 12 makes the statement, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by learning to think another way. And the wild part about it is that's exactly what repentance means. Repentance means to change the way you think. Folks, we've confused this. Can I just say that to you this morning? I want you to hear me because I'm not here just to have a church service. I'm ready for some change in my life and in yours. Amen. Repentance is not going through your life doing the same thing over and over again, apologizing to God for your failure. Repentance is changing the way you think about a circumstance so that through changing the way you think, you'll change the way you act. The Bible says be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind, by learning to think different. Now whose thoughts do you think you should be thinking? Well, you've got a lot of opportunity in this world. I'll be honest with you, they're backed by one of two kingdoms. It's either the kingdom of God or the kingdom of darkness. Amen. And it can come out of anywhere and be part of either one. And you're going to have to judge that. And in any way, the only thing you have to save you is the Word of God to allow you to judge what is the thoughts and the Word of Almighty God. And to begin to think like Him. Amen. He is a victor. I'm going to be honest with you. If you... You drag some old boy in here that isn't saved. You stand him up before that cross. You tell the historic story of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it looks like a pitiful failure. It does not look like victory. Until. Until you walk around to the victory side of an empty tomb. Because what the world saw as failure, Jesus walked out victorious. Now here's the problem. We're trying to judge victory off the mindset of the world. That's not the way it works. If everybody in this world calls you a loser and God is pleased with your life, you, my friend, are a victor. We've been judging by the world's standards Way too long. I believe that God will bless us financially. 
But I don't think every time I see somebody financially blessed, it's been because of God. You hear me? And it's time that we go back to the Word and allow it to build a picture of what true victory looks like. Look at me for a minute, church. Look at me for a minute. True victory looks like a bloody man hanging on a cross, dying in Jerusalem for the sins of the world. It is the most beautiful picture of the salvation and the victory of God that any man will ever be blessed to lay his eyes on. Because after they done all that to him. Now, I, I, I was, once in a while I get this urge and I go back. I love old, old music. There used to be a song that was sung in the church that went like this and went, Ain't no grave going to hold my body down. Remember that? Whew. I'm going to tell you, man, I look at that cross, and when I see it now, though I weep for the fact my sin sent him there, I look at him bleeding on that cross, and I realize it was but for a moment that he broke the chains of death forever. Isn't it powerful? Now, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, th this is, I'm just going to be honest with you about some things. I, I was telling uh, Bill before service that I, I have, uh, you hear people all the time, and it's the, it's, the, it's the big thing today that God has this wildly amazing plan for your life. And it's usually by, by, backed up by somebody doing something amazing in ministry. I believe that God has something extremely important for every person in this building. I think sometimes we keep striving for that thing that the world says is success. When in the middle of a dying generation, I wish we had some mamas that loved their kids enough to tell them about Jesus every night when they're going to bed. Some daddies that will get up every day of their life and speak the word into their children's life. No fanfare, nobody shouting, even though I'm sure the angels are rejoicing. No, I, that, that, those people that live out this life under the direction of the Spirit of God to accomplish the things that are most important to Him. Do you hear me this morning? That live their life day by day, sacrificing in different ways into the lives of not only their family, but their church family and the folks around them. I wonder what would happen if the Spirit of God began to live in the church again. I wonder how it would truly affect our homes and our communities and the people around us. That is my goal. That's my desire, first for me, then for you, that you and I begin to walk out this life living with our minds convinced that, number one, there's something greater ahead of us. And any sacrifice we face today, really, in the grand scope of things, doesn't matter to the point that it should knock us off balance. In Philippians chapter 2, you know, I think before God wants you laying hands on folks and casting devils out, he'd just like for us not to live like the devil when we leave church. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, and listen to this. I want you to listen to this today, and I do not want you to read this as just Scripture. I want you to read this as something God is telling you that you're supposed to do. Okay? Is that fair? Everybody smile. Are you mad at me? Don't be mad at me. We're going to take communion together in a little bit. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, 
but also to the interests of others. First thing out of the gate, he starts killing self, doesn't he? This next passage of Scripture is one that you should mark in your Bible, and I think it would do us good to read it every single day of our lives. It stops any heady or high-mindedness in our lives. It strips away from us that victim mentality. Let this mind be in you. I want to draw your attention to something. When it says, let this mind be in you, it means it's just not going to happen all by itself. You have a part to play. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus also. I love the fact that the Apostle Paul doesn't say, let this mind be in you that is in me, or that is in your pastor, or that is in your teacher, he immediately takes it to the superlative, to the highest place it can go. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus also. Now, if you'll back up to verse 4, how many of you know that what he's commanded you to do requires that mindset? Jesus didn't come here to pay for his sins. He come here to take care of somebody else, didn't he? Amen. Paul says, look on the good of others. Then he turns around and says, he knows we're going to struggle with it because we don't do that well. So he pulled out the big guns. He said, this is what Jesus thinks like. And then he shows us how he does that. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus also who thought it not robbery to be called equal with God. How many of you realize this morning that Jesus is equal with the Father? They're one. Do you have any idea who it was that left glory and came to this earth? Let me say to you before we go any further this morning, the sacrifice of Christ did not start at Calvary. It started as a baby in a manger. Amen, baby. It was sacrifice all the way. Once you get to heaven, you're going to think, why did I fight so hard to stay from here? Anybody want to leave heaven? I think it's going to be one of, the, one of the most severe acts of punishment when God sets up the judgment seat of Christ and men step into that heavenly realm only to be judged and have to turn around and walk away from what was designed for them. Amen. His sacrifice didn't start at the cross. It didn't start in the Garden of Gethsemane. It started when you heard that cry from that little baby in a manger. He was equal with God, and here he has restrained himself Well, I'm going to be honest with you. That ought to make you want to shout. Everybody thinks the love of God was demonstrated at the cross, and there it was. But I'm going to tell you something. From the moment of conception, as God entered this earthly realm, He was sacrificing every step of the way. Can you imagine? Now, think, think about this for a minute. I hope I don't bore you with this, but... Can you imagine leaving a place where there's no death, dying, no sickness, no disease to come to a place that is absolutely littered with it? To stand in the middle of angelic praise and hear as men and women that are around the throne of God shout the praises of God to come to a place that's silent and nobody even recognizes who you are and could care less. Hmm. You need to be convinced of your mission to be able to do this. That's why the Apostle Paul is addressing this, because brothers and sisters, this isn't natural. This is not natural. This is spiritual. Let this mind be in you. How do you do that? Well, about every time a thought comes in your head that's contrary to that thought, you get rid of it, and you surely don't act on it. Are you with me? The Bible says, bringing every thought into the obedience of Christ. 
judging that thing under the mindset that Jesus Christ walked through, you'll find out that there's a lot more sacrifice in you than you thought there was. Amen. Are you all okay? Cool beans. Man, I'm almost out of time already, and that's just my introduction. You know, one of the things, and, and I'm just going to slow down here because I, I, I just don't feel like moving fast. We, we may have to pick this up next Sunday, but I want to look at a couple of things here. I think still in the church we have the mindset that somebody took him. Do you know how much you must empty yourself? How much you sh would refrain from using your own strength to be pushed down to your knees in Pilate's judgment hall and have somebody put a cloth over your head and begin to hit you in the side of the head with a rod and say, if you're the Son of God, prophesy and tell us who it is that hit you. I can feel my blood beginning to boil. I can feel that natural man inside of me saying, ain't no man going to manhandle me like that. Amen. That is not the mind of Christ. How many of you realize that day he could have called out every name? He could have called their name. He took that whipping willingly. And then Paul has the audacity to say, let this mind be in you. And this is exactly what he's talking about. We, we listen to that verse of Scripture and we think about it when he comes back as a victorious king and steps down on the Mount of Olives and destroys everything in his path. And we're like, let that mind... Nope, that's not what he's talking about at all. You're never given the place to judge humanity. That's Jesus' job. Amen. I mean, as far as destruction is concerned. Are you all okay? Look at verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count it equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. I I'm going to be honest with you about something, folks. we got to do something about this servant thing. That thing is all over Scripture. And very seldom do we approach this as servants. You say, oh, we're sons. Yep, we're sons that serve. You say, I, give me some Scripture on that. I just did. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus also. He is a son that came to serve. I struggled for years because I would see something in Scripture that seemed like it was divided into two ways of thinking. I would see where God just miraculously healed His children and took care of them and delivered them out of the hands of the enemy. And then there was times I'd watch Him when He'd walk them right up and let them just die. And you know, we went around for a long time saying the ones that died didn't have enough faith. That's not right. That's not true. Amen. The Bible says that in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, that they all died in faith. Isn't that right? Until I realize that there's times when God will take His children that are serving Him that will allow themselves to be spent for the furtherance of, furtherance of the gospel. Are you with me? Let this mind be in you. My God, what a powerful statement. The fact that God will even give us access to the mind of Christ is phenomenal. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. Isn't that right? What's a sound mind look like? Looks like Jesus's. 
A sound mind has the ability not to be so caught up in the emotion of what's happening in the moment that they can see the value of what can be brought out of their life. Do you know that God has the power to take the most horrific situation in somebody's life and use it? I didn't say he designed it. I didn't say he caused it. He has the power to use it. And I will say this so you don't get confused. He knew before you got there what was going to happen. And if it happens, he must have been to some degree okay with it. There's nobody dies on this planet. The Bible says that not even a sparrow falls to the ground. Let this mind be in you. Can I tell you we're so caught up in our natural lives and not thinking spiritually to the point that we're frustrated every time we hit a hard spot? I've watched more people walk away from God for the dumbest reasons. I, I, I'm... I mean, I'm not trying to be rude, but that's just the deepest spiritual word I can find. It's just the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Walk away from God over another man or a woman. What are you thinking? Well, God, you know, the, the big phrase is today that God wants us to be happy all the time. I don't find that in Scripture. I'm serious. I think God wants us to have joy, but you'll find out that then they come along and write something crazy like, we're supposed to joy in tribulation. The joy He gives isn't dependent on your circumstance. It's dependent on His presence in your relationship. Amen. <laughs> That's why Paul and Silas could begin to sing in the midnight hour and begin to praise God. They weren't singing because they felt good. They were singing because He is good. Amen. Let this mind be in you. That was, you know, this thing is so powerful because not only does it tell us how we're supposed to think, it even shows us how we're supposed to act in the middle of the situation and what power can come out of it when we do it. Let me show you something. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus also. Now we find Jesus hanging on a cross and we hear him begin to pray. And his prayers doesn't sound anything like what we pray. Oh God, pull these nails from my hands. Is that what he prayed? Oh God, they don't have a right to do this to me. Is that what he prayed? Oh God, why did you let this happen to me? Is that what he prayed? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Let this mind be in you. That's a pretty big order, isn't it? Let the, but it is attainable. The Apostle Paul, God would have never allowed it in his word. If you and I don't have the ability through the power of the Holy Ghost to change the way we think, most of the time our lives are miserable because of the way we approach our lives. <clears throat> are you all okay? I, I'm about done. I'm going to hurry up and pull the Band-Aid off this real quick. Some of you are looking at me. Kind of weird. Depression is at an all-time high in the body of Christ. We walk around keeping track of the wrongs that have been done us. I've been guilty of this, friends. I'm not saying I'm not. I'm telling you that I don't want to go through the, the rest of my life not having joy in my life because of the actions of a few people. I would like to be mature enough to see beyond that. I would like to be unmoved by the thoughts of everybody else. I don't want to get up or lay down at night twisted up in thoughts about what somebody said about me. Amen. I want to have a life of joy and peace. I want to do what God's called me to do, whatever that looks like. And I don't want to allow foolish people to stop me from the will of God. Is anybody hearing me this morning? There's a statement made about Moses in Hebrews chapter 11. You can go there and read it. Uh, I don't remember exactly what verse it's in. I, I will tell you this. If it's a verse talking about Moses, it's in that one. It says he endured as one that saw the invisible. What a powerful statement. 
let me, let me, let me clarify just a little bit. It is somebody that can see beyond this natural realm, that can see the invisible God, that has the ability to place their faith in a kingdom that they have never laid their eyes on. And deciding that that is more important than anything here. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus also. Who thought it not Robert he would be called equal with God. But made himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant. And being found in the fashion of a man. Became obedient unto death. Even the death of of the cross. That's a powerful statement right there in all reality because most of us in, uh, in this new, I don't want to say new church, no, most of us in this generation doesn't understand what's being said there. There's a significance to why it said that. It, it doesn't say just unto death. It says even the death of the cross. How many of you know that there's a prophetic word that says cursed is anyone that is hung on a tree? Cursed by God is anyone that is hung on a tree. He's saying he's become obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. One of the things Jesus said when he's hanging on the cross is this. He said, my God, why have you forsaken me? You can hear him. I'd love for you to go back to Psalms 22 sometime and study out exactly what the Savior is seeing while he's hanging on that cross. And you can hear the cry of his, uh, of his heart in a moment's time as he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the Apostle Paul said, You need to let this mind be in you, friend. That God can use you for anything he wants. Anything he wants. Let me, let me ask you one question, then I'm, I'm, I promise I'm going to stop. Most of the time, most of the time we are offended by wrongs that happen to us because we don't feel we deserve it. Here's my question. Do you want mercy or justice? You can't have it both ways. You can't have God showing, treating you better than everybody else as a thought of justice or something that you deserve and still receive His mercy. No, the Bible says he counted all men as sinners. Not so that he could damn them, so he could give them grace. Amen. The Bible teaches that mercy triumphs over judgment. That's why folks that have messed up as bad as you and I have get to go to heaven in the first place. is because mercy triumphs over judgment. Let me... Let me Another question for you. Let, 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 me give you. let me give you an example. This is something really small. I was helping remodel a house one time, working with a guy that wasn't saved. I, I, I just went to help. I was already pastoring part here. I was already here on staff. I was just helping some folks out, and we were remodeling the house. And I used to, when I was young, uh, I, I helped build houses. That's what I've done from the time I was about 15 years old uh, for several years there. And I loved it, man. I, I loved that kind of work. But anyway, I went back in there, and it had been several years since I'd done anything like that, and I went back in there to help. And I, you ever, as you get older, you ever, you ever let your mind tell you you can do what you once done only to find out that you can't? When I was young, man, and I would do this, me and some of the guys we'd work with, we'd be putting on decking or framing up a wall, 
and usually when we framed up a wall, it was laid down. And man, we'd take a nail and flip it over, tap that thing one time and drive it with the next hit. I carried a 22-ounce framing hammer. And I mean, man, we just like tap, bang, drive that thing completely in first, second hit. I found out you can get out of practice. <laughs> so we're over there building this house, and, and I, I flip this nail up, and I've done it two or three times, and I'm getting a little, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I still got it. No, no, I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> I flip this nail up and forget to tap it the first time. I just drive it and bust my thumb wide open. I mean, you can honest to God, I can show you the scar after church. It runs right around there. Just split that bad boy wide open. Well, I'm old enough to be ashamed and don't want to tell anybody what I've done. They thought it was toughness. It wasn't. So I wrapped a tissue around my thumb. And there's blood splatter all over the floor. I don't say anything, man. I go back to driving nails. And, you know, driving nails and feeling about half sick to my stomach. But I'm driving nails. The guy that I'm working with walks by and he's like, my goodness, what's all this blood? I said, oh, man, I smashed my thumb. He said, man, that's bad. And really, it probably should have had stitches. You, I'm tough. I'm so tough. You don't. <laughs> It's a Saturday. Sunday morning, I walk in here. That man comes to church. Gives his life to Jesus that day. He said, if anybody can smash their thumb that bad and not cuss, <laughs> has to, they're, they're, they have to know God. I'd smash my thumb a thousand times. I don't know that God set that up that way, but it worked out that way, and I would smash my thumb a thousand times if it would bring somebody into the kingdom. I didn't scream and holler. Now, I'm going to be honest with you all because I know you all will. Well, I'm glad I didn't say some of the things that was running through my head. But it isn't about the absence of thought. It's about the absence of action. Are you with me this morning? Very small, very minute. But if God can use a situation like that, what would happen if you and I just begin to bear up under the burden of walking through this life and allow the mind of Christ to be in us. You know, that place where you have them, man, you could destroy them in a heartbeat and you show mercy when they never would you. Let this mind be in you. Matthew, get ready. Check this out. I was praying the other day about this verse of Scripture. And I have a very vivid imagination. And I can see Jesus being whipped at the whipping post. Uh, the Passion of the Christ is powerful. One of my favorite scenes in that movie is when those guys, there's two of them, and they're literally sweating and beating him right down to the ground to where he slides down that pole. And then that bloody hand reaches up and gets a hold, and he stands back up. And I'm, I mean, we were in the theater that day, and I'm almost screaming at the top of my lungs, look at that. And I realized this that he had the same power that day to destroy his enemy as he does at the end of time. But he does not use it. Folks, let this mind be in you. You have such an awesome opportunity. We together in this world have such an awesome opportunity to show people the love of God to show them mercy like they've never known before, to testify of all the good things God has done in our lives, to share with them when they are dead wrong. If a man ever comes to this church or a person hooked on alcohol or drugs, 
and they fall off the wagon, you and I should be standing beside them going, it's not what we wanted, brother. But can I tell you, he's been so merciful to me. Is there anybody in here that God's been good to when you didn't deserve it? When he saw every nasty thing you've done and everything he said and he treats you like a child and not a reject? Let this mind. They are killing your Savior. And Paul said you need to start thinking like that. I want you to come back next Sunday. So I can finish this. I've got something I want to show you next week. Give you just a little tidbit. This is the will of God. The cross was the will of God for Jesus. Do you know that? It was the will of God. The Bible says, Humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God, that in due time he might exalt you. How many of you see that in the life of Jesus? He humbles himself under the will of God, under the mighty hand of God. And then when he dies, God exalts him to his right hand. The next verse says, resist the devil. How many of you know that the act of humbling unto God is the act of resisting? Let me finish that for you next week. Would you stand with me, please? Matthew, come. With every head bowed and every eye closed in this place. Every head bowed and every eye closed, please. We are heading for a visitation, a habitation of Almighty God. I am praying, God, for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this place. My views of what that looks like is changing drastically. I'm not saying there won't be shouting and dancing, but I imagine there's going to be a lot of weeping that precedes it. We bring ourselves and give ourselves back to God. For the Bible declares, draw nigh unto me, and I'll draw nigh unto you. It means quit living like you want to and start living like I say. This morning in this place, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, friend, God brought you here for that purpose. He loves you. There is nothing greater than being in the kingdom of God. If you'd like to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up right where you are. Is there anybody very quickly? Just keep your heads bowed and let me speak to you for a second. Malcolm, put a prayer of salvation on our Facebook page, please. Type it out, if you would. This morning, I came for you. This morning, the Spirit of God is here for you. He's not trying to beat you down. He wants to build you up. He wants to make us usable in the hands of God. There's no greater honor in the life of a man than that the eternal God would use him as a vessel of honor. I'm just going to pray for you this morning. I'm going to ask you to come back next Sunday. Let's find out how to stop the devil. How to stop him in our lives. There is victory in Jesus. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come. You've heard the words that have been spoken in this place. And I ask God that the seed of that word would penetrate the hearts of your people. That, Father, we would humbly come before you and do all that you've called and asked us to do. Use us as individuals in this community. Let us be a light in a dark world for the people in our families and the people all around us. Let us be that changing force. But first, Father, let the mind of Christ rest in your people. 
Let selfishness and arrogance and pride be stopped this morning. Let us look at how the enemy has attacked and let's stop that avenue. We give you glory, sir. I pray for every person in this building that they might be strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Matthew. Amen. Ushers, if you will go ahead and come and begin passing.